so the root cause is certain microbes in the rumen. They're taking fatty acids from the diet, unsaturated fatty acids, and they're converting them to um, intermediates uh, that are reach the mammary gland and they decrease milk fat synthesis in the mammary gland. We've identified some of these. Um, one is trans 10 cis 12 CLA. There are certainly others. These are formed by rumen microbes and that's what's causing the depression. Hi, I'm Bill Weiss, host of the Dairy Black Belt uh, podcast. My guest today is Dr. Tim Hackman, a, a former The OSU graduate. He's now an associate professor at uh, University of California at Davis. His research interest includes improving nutrition of ruminants through study of microbes in the rumen or of the rumen and working on increasing microbial protein supply, uh, increasing animal digest nutrient digestibility and discovering pathways microbes use to ferment carbohydrates. Tim, welcome to the, sh to the show. Well, thank you for having me. A little while ago, I don't have the exact date, but fairly recently, you wrote a little article for Journal of Dairy Science. Uh, it's called A Perspective, and it was on um, how to address the root cause of milk fat depression. And I found it really, this is a different type of paper, and I found it really interesting. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I guess to start off with, we just need a definition. How, how do you define milk fat depression? Yeah, so milk fat depression is, as we talk about in the paper, is any loss of milk fat that happens when microbes from the rumen produce unusual fatty acids. We can talk exactly how this happens, but the net result is that milk fat can decrease by up to 50%. And, and I, I get this, or I used to get this question a lot, is it... Fat yield or fat percent, you know, if cows produce more milk, fat percent may go down a little bit, but are you talking really about redu reductions in milk fat yield? Yeah, milk fat yield is the more precise way to talk about it. So output, yes, you do see a decrease in percent often, but yeah. really it's yield that's most important. But if, if production went up and yield and percent went down a little bit, that's not what you were, what we're talking about today. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Why don't you give us a little, again, this is a complex cis, uh, uh, discussion, but give us a little brief background on the current uh, theory behind the, the root cause of milk fat depression. Right. Yeah. So the root cause is certain microbes in the rumen. They're taking fatty acids from the diet, unsaturated fatty acids, and they're converting them to um, intermediates uh, that are reach the mammary gland and they decrease milk fat synthesis in the mammary gland. We've identified some of these. Um, one is trans 10 cis 12 CLA. There are certainly others. These are formed by rumen microbes and that's what's causing the depression. We don't fully understand what microbes are producing them. Um, so there are still some unknowns. An alternative pathway of, of biohydrogenation. That's correct. Yeah. So they're, they're biohydrogenating the fatty acids. Biohydrogenation is a completely normal process in the rumen by which unsaturated fatty acids are converted to saturated ones. But this unusual, this abnormal pathway can happen and it produces intermediates that are reach the mammary gland and depress milk fats. And, and, and in your paper, you have a discussion, a brief discussion on buffers. And I thought that also was interesting. Can, can we just fix this problem by feeding buffers? Right. So a lot of people feed buffers. Paper I was able to identify to try to quantify it said 50% of farms in California. When I ask um, people around the field, they say it, it's more than that. A lot of people are feed, feeding buffers. So does that help fix the problem? Certainly. Um it does. It's not fully understood how buffers are acting, but they do help with milk fat depression. The issue is that the available evidence suggests that they don't stop it entirely. Um, the one paper I was able to find that quantified the problem showed that depression of 11% still happens even when feeding buffers. Yeah. So yes, they're useful tools, but they're not completely effective. And we don't know exactly how they're working. Um, there could be more effective ways of stopping it buffers could have effects that we may not 
want possibly. Um, it would be good to have something that is uh, that's acting more effectively and is more specific for the problem. That brings us up to the pretty much the topic of your paper. And that's what you introduced the the possibility of enzyme enzyme inhibitors. D discuss first of all what what an enzyme inhibitor is and how this might be used in milk fat depression. Sure. So an enzyme inhibitor is a chemical compound that stops enzymes from carrying out a chemical reaction. That's the general definition. Um, in this context, what we're proposing is to find inhibitors that would stop the enzymes microbes are using to produce these antilipogenic fatty acids, their production. Um, the enzyme inhibitor that's most well known in animal agriculture right now is 3-NOP. That's an inhibitor of methane production. What it's doing is it's targeting the last enzyme that's responsible for methane formation. It's modifying the enzyme. It's stopping the substrate from being converted to the product, methane. And what we're proposing is to find an inhibitor that can do much the same thing, but for um, enzymes that are producing these fatty acids, like transpen um, uh, cis-12 CLA. Any, any possible candidates for these compounds? or Yeah, what, what possible candidates are there? There's actually one possible candidate already. So uh, one enzyme forming transcensus 12 has been characterized. The scientists who characterized it found that polyethylene glycol will enter the active side of the enzyme and it'll stop linoleic acid. Um, that is what's converted to transcensus 12 from entering. Um, they didn't continue this research because they weren't interested in it. They wanted to see how linoleic acid binds to it. Um, but the evidence is that polyethylene glycol will stop uh, the, the normal substrate from entering. Um, and so we're not sure if this would be the best one, but we have this idea that we could screen inhibitors against the enzyme and we could stop production. Introducing Ultrasorb R3.0, Volac's comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 is a species-specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharides binding capabilities. Endotoxins such as LPS can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production. Learn more about Ultrasorb R3.0 at volac.com. If you were interested in these compounds, what, what research is needed? I mean, yeah, you know, feeding studies are expensive. And so where would you start? Yeah. So there's a lot of work that's needed. This is just an idea at this point. I have to underscore that. Um, so what we need to do first and what we have started is we need to test potential inhibitors in the lab with bacteria. This is the same way that 3NOP was developed. It was screened against methanogens in the lab before it was fed to cows. So we need to um, expose bacteria to these inhibitors and see if it stops them from producing these fatty acids. Um, one difficulty is that we don't know all the bacteria that are producing these fatty acids. And until recently, we had none in the lab. My lab had to isolate one. It took us about six months, but we have one right now. We're growing it actually in the lab, and that's what I'll check after we're done talking, um, and we can test these inhibitors against them. Um, but that's the very first step. And then we would scale uh, up. We would go to batch cultures with vermin fluid and then continuous cultures with vermin fluid and then eventually to cows. But there are a lot of steps that need to be taken first. Just to wrap up, and I know research is always uh, unknown, <laughs> Um, what kind of timetable do you think you're looking at if this proves out in all the steps as where you, you might try it in cows? Sure. So I think a common time frame people give when they don't know is just to say five years. So I'll <laughs> say that. Um, it depends a lot on how much interest we have and how much support we have. I think we have some um, people in industry who are, who are interested in developing this. The more support we get and the more that we can develop these compounds and investigate the bacteria that are responsible for this, the faster it'll go. But yes, it is unknown. It's just an idea. Well, Tim, this has been really interesting. I really enjoyed that paper. This is the first one of these perspectives I've ever read. That was really interesting. But, but thanks for joining us today. Yeah, well, thank you.